everyone, and thank you for joining us for this installment of our application webcast series. This presentation is going to be on printing your parts in 3D using the FDM technology. So here's the webcast topics. There's still a few left today. If you'd like to register for them, we've got uh, our Altium, our E, uh, our Electronics CAD, ECAD solution. We're doing one on 3D via. Mike Spence is going to be doing one on our documentation uh, 3D via package. And um, also we're going to do one on our EPDM. Jeff Girardi is going to be doing that on our product data management tool. So go ahead and just go to our website, uh, probably like you did to register for this one, and uh, just click on that new seven-part product design application webcast events and register for those last three. So this is going to be a presentation of printing your parts in 3D. Uh, my name is Chris McBain. I'm the Manufacturing Technology Manager here at GoEngineer. And I want to cover a little bit more in depth about 3D printing and the FDM technology. There's a lot of uses and applications for FDM that a lot of people might not be really aware of. Um, a lot of people use it for prototyping. It's fine in design validation. But there's also a lot of things like end use parts, uh, jigs and fixtures, things like that. And another great thing about um, FDM technology is that you can modify your parts, how they're built, make them lighter, make them a little stronger, um, really modify the way that it's building to customize it, um, whether you want it off the machine faster or, like I said, you want it stronger. Um, it's really, um, you know, here it says new rules for plastic parts. And that's really it because there's a lot of things, too, that go away. Undercuts aren't an issue anymore. Draft isn't an issue anymore. Things that you are um, designing in your, your molds, you don't have to worry about a lot of that stuff because this is in a, a 3D printing environment. Okay, And, you know, I'm going to show you at the end of this a little bit about how the workflow is, how you go from a part on your screen to a part in your hand. So let's talk about some of the applications for uh, FDM technology. Again, a lot of people know it for prototyping, things like that. Because you're working with thermoplastics, it's a really great solution for jigs and fixtures. We can see here there's a couple fixtures that are made and jigs. Uh, the one in the upper right-hand corner is actually one that Auric Vacuum uses to uh, CMM some of their castings. The one on the bottom there is actually a fixture for placing an emblem on a automobile, on the trunk of an automobile, making sure that it's straight and lined up and all that other stuff. Just looking at these parts, you can imagine if you had to fabricate these, whether it's on a CNC machine or, geez, an injection mold or something like that, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort to, to get all those programs out here. The printing technology is so easy and so um, straightforward, it's very simple to make parts like this. So we're talking jigs and fixtures um, in your manufacturing environment. So let's say you needed to hold a circuit board um, in order to solder it. Things like that um, is a really good place for FTM technology. Uh, molds is another really great application. Um, on the upper right, you can see that's a vac uh, vacuum form mold. With the FTM technology, you can actually make the models porous. So it's not a fully dense model. And because it's porous, it, there's a couple really good applications. One is, again, the vac forming. Uh, you can make a vacuum buck out of this. Um, and the one in the middle of your screen is paper pulp molding. Paper pulp molding is what we're used to in the past is egg crates, egg cartons, things like that. But now, you know, you buy a cell phone or electronic gadget, a handheld gadget, a lot of the packaging is being done in paper pulp. You know, for a lot of reasons, it's it's inexpensive, it's recyclable, um, and uh, you know, it's it's a pretty fast turnaround. Uh, especially with this FDM technology. The way that it's done in the past, it's kind of a lost art. There's a lot of uh, pre-machining and layup with screens to make it you know, pull the paper pulp up. Um, with this technology, you basically print your paper pulp mold and you're ready to go. And last but not least, we have some end-use parts. Um, there's a turbo up there you can see for testing. And on the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that's actually a vent for an aircraft. Uh, it's printed in a material called Altem, which is FAA approved. Some of you guys might have heard of it um, for its uh, properties for gassing and flame. Re it doesn't flame. It doesn't release noxious gas if it sets on fire. So you can imagine if you're going to make a vent, how would you do that in, uh, in aluminum or, or or metal or even plastic injection molding? That would be pretty tricky. Here we have a lot of customers in the aerospace field that are actually making end-use parts that are going right on aircrafts, um, even as far as NASA is using it to put in on some of the uh, deep space projects that they're working on. 
All right, so let's make sure that we're all really on the same page about what exactly FDM technology is and how it works. All right, so I'm just going to give you this brief overview with this video. We start with a 3D model. All right, you model it in 3D. You're actually going to save this out as an STL model. An STL model is a surface model that triangulates the surfaces and breaks it into triangles. Once you have that STL model, you bring it into the software that comes with your, your FDM machine and it spl slices it into 10,000 steps and processes it. At that point, you just send it out to the machine. That's what you're seeing right now. This is sped up for, uh, for time reasons. I'm going to sit here and watch this whole thing go. But um, you can see it's actually laying down. I think this one is about a 7,000th bead going around of thermoplast material. This happens to be ABS, uh, white ABS. And not only does it process the the part, but it also processes all the supports for it also. So you can see it's this building is putting the supports around it. And then there's the end part, and it comes off the machine. So a really easy process uh, to go through, again, starting with this model and going through the whole process there. So let's talk about <coughs> building the parts. Uh, you know, everybody does something a little bit different, you know, from appearance models to those, say, those fixtures that we saw before, um, medical use parts, things like that. Really, you ask yourself, what's important with the model that I'm building? Does it need to be strong? Those fixtures, for instance, those need to be nice and durable. The surface finish on those, probably not that important. So I don't have to worry about a, a big step over or step down for the what we call rastering or tool paths for the FDM machine. So, But we want it to be really strong, so we might make it solid. Now, what that's going to do is going to use a lot of material, and it's going to take a little bit longer to build, but that's what's important. If we're doing a mouse like this, for instance, we're worried about surface finish and probably build time. You know, this is, there's probably some kind of um, of deadline for this, right? We want to get a model out to a vendor or customer, or maybe we have a presentation coming up. So at that point, we're going to modify how this is built. I'm going to show you a few options for that. So here we have our build style. So let's say this you're looking at the inside of a part. All right. We have our on the very top. You can see that's a solid build, so it's just going to lay material down, make that thing a solid uh, piece of ABS um, or whatever material you choose. Um, the the mojos, the U prints, the dimensions, those are going to run your your ABS materials. When you start getting up into the Fortis machines, you're going to have more options as far as polycarbonate machines, polycarbonate or materials, polycarbonate blends, um, ABS blends. Uh, all, that Ulta material that I spoke about. Um, the material list is ever growing. Every year, um, Stratasys comes out with, with new modified materials that have different uh, applications. But for here, for instance, getting back to this, if we want to fill this, let's say if we wanted a part that was really strong, we'd build it solid. If we want a part that's really light and it's going to build pretty fast, and I'm not too concerned about how strong it is, um, I'm going to do that second one, which is a sparse build. Basically, all that does is just put some supports in the middle of the part instead of making it solid, just to give me kind of a shell um, that I can look at. Maybe it's a, a feel, a, a form study, something like that. And then last but not least is that what we call sparse double dense. And uh, you can see that's kind of a cross between solid and sparse. It gives a little bit more strength than your sparse build, um, but doesn't take as long to build as if we built it solid. So you can imagine, so here you have a lot of flexibility as far as how your part's being built. And... Um, you have a control over you know what you're looking for again surface finish strength time material usage things like that so that's the actual model so when we're actually building the model on the machine it has to be supported as it builds up this, for instance this fan that you see on your screen those blades there has to be some material underneath it for that material to build on so we have some support styles how do you want to support this you can actually just choose the basic support so just by what we call hitting the green flag. There's a little button. You're going to see that in a little bit. Um, it's going to use all the defaults, and it's just going to build the basic supports on your part for you. And this is, you know, most of the time, this is fine. And again, you don't have to go through this every single time. You don't have to say, oh, I, I need to define all the supports. I need to define all the materials. You can actually set um, presets, and there are presets that come with uh, the software, that you just hit a button, and it's going to calculate all those out for you. So this is your basic support. You know, you can use it on pretty much all your parts. Um, you know, all the parts are accessible, things like that. Um, let's talk about a little bit about um, if uh, you needed to surround your part. If you have a big, tall part that's sitting on your table and you want to build that up, um, if we look at the upper right-hand corner, at the very bottom of that part, you'll see a little bit of yellow, and that's just the support for this basic part. 
um, you know, this part's sticking up, and that table's moving back and forth. You know, the higher it gets, you know, the center of gravity moves, and that thing's going to want to wiggle around a little bit. What I really want to do is I want to secure that as the part's building up, so I'm going to surround it with uh, this build material. There's surround supports on it. This is really good if you have taller parts, for instance. Okay? So... I've talked about the material, I've talked about the support, so we know, kind of get an idea about how this machine works, um, laying down these one at a time with the support material, build material, things like that. So let's talk about what happens if, there's the support material, what happens if your part's too big? You have uh, a smaller table, and let's say your table's 12 inches, and you need to make a part that's 18 or 20 inches across, how are you going to split that up? Um, even on the bigger machines, you want to make a really big tabletop, for instance, and you, let's say you have the one of the biggest machines uh, out there, the Fortis 900, um, you'd still have to section that part out. How hard is it to section these parts? This is one of the things I really, really like about uh, the Stratasys line and the software that comes with it. It makes sectioning parts really, really easy to do. So the first one is, let's say we want to section it in Z. Let's say the part's too tall to fit in my machine and I need to build it in two parts. You can actually do a top section and it'll actually put locator pins on the bottom and it'll put the location divots on the top for you so it's going to be really easy to register those parts. Another option for section in Z is a registration feature. You can see there it's kind of a tapered wall, kind of a boss that sticks out that this can go onto and um, it's going to register really nice in the Z. Okay, and this is all automatic. You don't have to draw any of this geometry. These are options that you have in the software that say section this part out. It's going to section it for you. If it's too long or too wide to go onto your machine, you can you have to section with the profile. So here you can see that uh, the software will automatically put in this dovetail feature, this puzzle piece feature for you, and this is what the part looks like. So it's going to automatically put the male on one side, the female on the other, and these are going to go together, go together really easy, and you don't have to kind of guess and line these things up and use surface plates and all that other stuff. Um, last but not least, this is one of my favorite ones. This is a section with profile. These are called registration features, and what the software will do um, is it'll actually, you give it a line, and it'll actually put all of these little scallop marks in across that surface. And these scallop marks, again, you put the, it puts the male on one side, the female on the other. These just go together really nice. And let's talk about putting these things together. You know, we're talking about... Um, the FDM technology using thermoplastic, so we're talking ABS, polycarbonates, things like that. Um, really easy to bond together. Uh, there's ABS solvent out there that you can solvent weld these together. Heck, you could just use uh, super glue if you'd like and put these together. Uh, there's a lot of uh, very easy approaches to getting these models and gluing them together and attaching them. Um, solvent is, is works really, really, really well. And speaking of the durability of the thermoplastics too, not only is it is it easy to glue together, but it's also really um, it's rigid. It's very sturdy material. Some of the other uh, solutions out there for prototyping are very um, temperature sensitive and very sensitive to UV exposure. Uh, SLA, for instance, uh, it actually that stuff cures um, the goo that they use for the SLA material cures under UV light. And the more, it just keeps curing and curing forever. So, you know, the more light that it sees, the harder and more brittle it gets. And it actually discolors and does some pretty ugly things. You're making parts out of ABS. I mean, what you get is what you get, and that's what it's going to be. Uh, it's Most of the parts, you know, from telephones to computer monitors are uh, made out of ABS. So it's a, a, a industry standard. It's really, really good, durable material. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the software a little bit. I've, I've talked a little bit about... Um, bringing this into the software, processing what the software does, being able to section it. Um, I'm going to go over um, this part that you see on your screen. Uh, if we look at this as it rotates around, you can see that if I had to injection mold this, what what a headache. Um, I don't even know that it would be possible. I'm sure, you know, anything's possible, right? Good, faster, cheap, pick two. But, um, you know, machining this is definitely would be five axis with a lollipop cutter going in there. Um, it would be pretty difficult to make this part. Uh, so I opted to print it. I'm going to go ahead and print this part. Um, and I'm going to use uh, the software, the Insight software, that comes with the Fortis line of machines. So there's, depending on what machine you get, depends, uh, it dictates what software that you have to run it. For instance, the Mojos, the Dimensions, the Uprints, those all run uh, using a software called Catalyst. Catalyst, very straightforward, very basic software. Basically, you bring a part in, print it, that's great. 
the Fortis line of machines actually come with a more powerful software called Insight. Insight software gives you a little bit more control over the build styles, like I went over a little bit. Um, it can it gives you the ability to really fine tune those tool paths for, if we're in a production setting. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use the Insight software for my demonstration today. Let me back up here for a second. There we go. All right, so. Here's my Insight software. The first step that you would do is you would actually create a 3D model. Uh, it doesn't really matter what software you use as long as it outputs an STL model. I created that specific model in SolidWorks and I saved it out as an STL model. So I'm going to go ahead and just open up that STL model in my Insight software and there it is. This shows me a grid. It's about the size of my table. Let me move this over a little bit. Each one of those squares represents an inch. So I can kind of get an idea of uh, the size of this part. So this is the way that it came in. And actually, this is the way that I want to build it. But what happens if it comes in in some wonky orientation and I want to build it a different way? Let's say I want to optimize the supports on it. Um, another optimization that you do when you put this on a machine or consideration that you have when you build this is strength. Because it's put down in layers, right? there's almost, say, a grain to the way that uh, the parts come out. Uh, it's very um, it's very durable going across the grain, but when you go with the grain, it has a little bit more tendency to uh, be a little bit, I wouldn't say fragile, but not as durable as if you went across the grain. So for this one, this is actually going to be perfect, but let's say I wanted to make this upside down. I wanted to flip this around. Really easy to do. In here, I just work left to right. I can say, you know what? I want... I don't want that to be the top. Actually, you know what I want to be the bottom? I want to be that surface to be the bottom. You can see that it automatically flips it over. Okay. Or I can say, you know what? I want that surface to be the left side surface. I want to build it in this orientation. But really, this part is really builds the best using the flat there as the bottom. Okay. <clears throat> Again, I talked about working left to right. So now the process is this part gets broken down into slices, so I can slice the STL model. Then it's going to apply the wall thickness and actually figure out um, where those tool paths are going to go inside of it. Then it's going to build a support structure and then actually make the tool paths. I can do that individually, that's fine. Or I, I mentioned really briefly um, the green flag. By pressing the green flag, it's going to use the presets that are already in the uh, in the software. I could use my own presets, or here, if we look over here, is my modeler setup. This is my. It's going to do a solid build. Um, it's going to do a surface style with a sparse support. I can just go ahead and hit this green flag and see do all remaining processes. So I haven't done anything. So I'm going to go ahead and click that green flag really quick, and you're going to see that it's going to go ahead and it's going to slice it. Then it's going to go ahead and create supports for it. Then it's going to do some boundary curves and write the tool paths and all that other stuff. And it's actually a pretty fast process as it slices through this. And then it's going to write this CMB file. And that's the actual uh, tool path file that I'm going to send to the machine. All right, let's see what this thing looks like. So now when I see this, what we're looking at here is the red is the actual build material. The, the other colors down here the yellows and the blues are the actual uh, support materials. If I zoom in pretty close, you can see as I zoom in, you can see each one of those lines represents a tool path. So this shows me how that part is going to be built in the tool paths there. Right? This is great. So this is just part of it. So this is the first half. The first half is, is processing the model, getting the slices together, getting the support structures where they need to be, things like that. The next step is actually sending this to the machine. So this is basically getting, getting it ready to print, and this is going to go ahead and print it. So when I go ahead and print this, it's going to pull up this control center software, and this shows me a map of my machine bed. And this is the footprint of the part, and it shows me where that footprint is going to be laid. All right, so if I just want one part, I can say, you know, repack it. It's going to put it right in the middle for me. This one part's going to pay, take about two hours to build, two hours and 53 minutes. That's great. I, at this point, I can say build job. It's going to send it out to the machine and start uh, 
putting toolpath on it on and start laying down layers on the machine. But let's say I, I want to fill this bed up a little bit more. Let's say I don't want one of these. I want a couple. I can say, you know, let's copy these and give me, oh, I don't know, five more copies of that. So I'm going to have six total. So I can say repack. There it is, moving it in the center. Center it all. Perfect. Okay. Um, it'll automatically kind of optimize the distance between the parts for me, figure out what the fastest build is going to be. This is great. So let's say, so this is going to take 17 hours. Let's say I really wanted to pack this bed full of parts. Um, I wanted to make not just that ball part, but there's another part that goes with this called an arm, and I want to make that arm part also. Um, I would just come here and say insert my CMB. I've already, I've already processed it. This is that process file. And I can say, you know what? I want to go ahead and process that also. And you know what? Let me make another copy of that too. Let's click OK. So there's my arm. All right. So I can also kind of manually move this around. I can say, you know, rotate this 90 degrees. Say so put that up like there. It's going to be pretty optimized. Okay. So what happens if, will it warn me if those parts are overlapping? It sure will. If I get too close, if the supports overlap or the actual parts overlap, you can see I get a crosshatched part. And it actually says, hey, something's wrong here. Something's not right. You can see it's going here. Even if I mix all of these up, if I have all of these, I can just hit repack. And it's going to figure out an optimized tool path for me as far as how fast it's going to take to build. So what happens if I add too many parts to this? Let's check that out. So let's say I want to copy that, um, that original ball again. So let's say we're going to copy. Let's say I want, I don't know, 10 more copies of these. I click OK. See, I get this warning. It says, hey, I can only fit six more of those parts into the pack. What do you want to do with those other four? Do you want to go ahead and put them in there and do your best to manipulate them yourself or you know what you just want to add the four pieces. I'm going to say you know what I just want to add those four pieces. There we go. And I can actually come here and it see it's pretty smart. I actually added those four pieces and I don't know that I can actually fit these in. So now what do I do? Now I've got these parts in here. They're not fitting. I don't know where to fit them. I just click on the ones I want to remove and I just click remove. There we go. Everything's happy. It's all nice, right? So you can see you can do multiple parts on the same job. Um, you can do multiple jobs per table. It's really, really intuitive. So now we can see here with this, uh, the amount of parts they've got here, it's going to run for 42 hours, right? So all these parts, you know, I've got 10 parts, 11, 12 parts, whatever it is. Um, I can run this. I can hit this, uh, hit print on this on Friday when I leave. Monday when I get in, these parts are going to be ready to come off of the table, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So that's that's as easy as it is. So at this point, I just say build job, and uh, it's looking for the machine right now. It's the machine's not really connected. So I would say build job just like sending it to your printer, your office printer. It would just send it over there. I'd get up, walk over to the printer, make sure that the table's cleaned off and everything, and and uh, hit go, and it would start printing these parts for me. So talking about cleaning this off, this is another big advantage of FDM technology. With a lot of the other uh, prototyping machines out there, SLA, SLS, um, those object machines, things like that, they're great machines. They do serve, you know, they, they have their own um, uses, but the cost of ownership of those machines is pretty high. Um, not only is the material weight very expensive, it's also pretty caustic. You can't just throw it in the garbage. You have to do some hazmat stuff to get rid of it. And uh, the amount of time it takes to maintain those machines, cleaning the goo off or cleaning the, the nylon, the powdered nylon off of the machines, the used material, the unused material, you know, wiping them down, wiping all the heads off. It's a pretty time-consuming um, scenario. You know, it's not as easy as, say, this, where I just walk over and make sure that there's no parts still on the bed. I hit go and it starts printing the parts out for me. It's very, very low maintenance on these machines. Just make sure that there's material in there. You know, make sure that the bed's nice and clean and you're ready to go. Okay, so that's basically it for the software. So we kind of saw um, the flow of this, the flow of how this is going to uh, go. You know, you start with that 3D part, um, you bring it into, you bring it into your uh, you bring that STL model into the software, whether it's Catalyst or Insight, and uh, process it, and then bring it in here, and then just put it on the table and hit print. Again, just like sending it to any office printer. Okay. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you for attending the printing to your parts, or printing your parts in 3D. Again, my name is Chris McBain. Please feel free. If you guys saw something that, that really sparked your interest, that you really liked, that you want to... Um, that you think, hey, I have this application, I wonder if it would work, please give me a call um, or go
go ahead and email me. You can call me at any of the eight, at any of the Go Engineer numbers. They'll track me down. Or you can feel free to email me at the email on your screen, cmacbain at goengineer.com. And let's talk about it. Let's talk about some of the uses that you might have for your machine. If you, if you have one, you're thinking about getting one, and you just, you know, you want to think outside the box a little bit. Let's talk about fixtures. Let's talk about molds, things like that, end use parts. So, you know, there's, there's so much out there that this FDM technology can do. And uh, it's really exciting. So please feel free to give me a call at your convenience if you want to discuss the technical aspects of it. And uh, thank you so much for attending. Thank you.